So uh, this story is coming out in uh, an anthology called Dead Letters, edited by Conrad Williams, and it's going to be out next spring. And what Conrad did was he mailed a bunch of us uh, some trash in an envelope, and uh, in an envelope marked Return to Sender, and uh, we had to uh, make what we would out of it. Hmm. And uh, uh, when I when I, I got the um, well, I got the envelope probably about a year before I before the story was due, and I put off writing it, and I put off writing it, and I put off writing it because I you know. The ideas were kind of nebulous. The, you know, the, the materials were very stimulating, but the, the, the idea was nebulous. And then I got cancer, and the whole thing snapped into focus. So this, this is a little close to the bone. It's called Cancer Dancer. Weird shit happens to you when your life turns into liminal space. Actually, I thought it was a conceptual shift. When the oncologist tells you that the uterine cancer they thought was gone has come back, and you're looking at a life expectancy of maybe two years, the personal paradigm shift is like nothing you've ever been through before. I can't speak to anyone else's experience, but here's mine. When you have a baby, you find out what's important, and that, my friend, is the fucking secret of life. I'm sure there are other ways to get clued up about that. This is how I learned it. And I figured that was the big one. I'd never do anything more profound than become somebody's mother. It never occurred to me that big things aren't the only things, aren't only things you do. They also happen to you. The Macmillan Cancer Center in London is a pretty nice place. They made it look like a hotel lounge or maybe a casual reading space in a library. I've been to the Google office space or whatever it's called in East London where you can go work on your startup or find somebody else's. And the Macmillan Center is nicer than that. It would be a great place to hang out if you didn't wish you had to go there. I knew it was cancer. I'd had a brush with uterine cancer the year before and they'd taken care of it with a hysterectomy. I just didn't know whether this was the same thing or something new. I was thinking things like, will I go bald? And is there a special place to buy those I have cancer head scarves? And am I going to puke so much that I actually lose some weight? Think shit like that. And then the oncologist, this nice lady in a tasteful wool dress, even more tastefully accessorized with a print scarf, a gold brooch, and plain black pumps with low but authoritative heels, tells me I'm looking at two years, and then she adds, it could be less. My Macmillan Macmill nurse phones while I'm on my way home on the bus. She's great, my Macmillan nurse, but I tell her I'll call her back later because I don't feel like subjecting the stranger sitting nearby to my tale of woe. But after she hangs up, I consider talking aloud to the dead phone as if she were still there just to get it out of my system. The oncologist said this, and I said that, and then I feel blah, blah, blah. So you think you're having a bad day, cheer up, pilgrim. It could be a fuck ton worse. But I don't. I am very short on luck, and what little I have ain't good. The phone would probably ring in the middle of my soliloquy of sorrow. I'd go from tragic heroin to the punchline of a real life anecdote which would probably go viral on YouTube, courtesy of someone else's cell phone. Life is ready to kill you without provocation. Why tempt fate into humiliating you before you go? My downstairs neighbor, Tim, was outside puttering around in the front yard when I got home. He's a nice young man, not even half my age and half again as tall. Normally I'd stop to talk to him, but not today. I know it's going to come pouring. It's, I know it's going to come pouring out if I open my mouth, and we do not know each other well enough for that kind of disclosure. Being a nice guy, he'd probably invite me in for a cup of tea and listen sympathetically, but I can't handle that right now. Plus, like I said, he's half my age. He probably thinks 62 is old. So I smile, try to look like I've got too much to do, too much to stop and chat, too much to do to stop and chat, and zip through my front door as fast as I can work the locks. The postman has come and gone, leaving me a single yellow envelope on the carpet at the foot of the stairs. Two thick blue lines are drawn through the address, and in, and in black marker the word, deceased. Not yet, thanks very much, I tell the envelope, picking it up. There's a number written in pencil like a serial number. It means nothing to me. In black ink, a different hand has printed, no longer at this address, and underneath what could be a name or initials, J-E-P. 
hey, don't assume someone died, I scrolled the envelope and turned on the overhead light so I could see who, who this was addressed to. Detective Sergeant Michael Paris, retired, the Oak House, Station Road, Fish Pond, Bristol. One of the lines goes through the postcode, so I can't read it, but it doesn't matter. I don't know anyone in Bristol, nor do I know any cops, retired or otherwise. I turn the envelope over, but there's nothing except return to sender in the same blue as the lines through the address. Wrong sender, I say. I'm about to tell myself to stop talking out loud like some crazy old lady when I notice that the envelope's been opened. It's cut open, and the stamp or franking removed. Geez, how blind am I, I wonder. Should have gone to whatchamacallit. Even as I'm thinking I should ask Tim if this is his, I'm emptying the contents into my hand. Fuck it, I've had a rough day. I'm in the mood for the cheap thrill of reading someone else's mail. I have no idea what I might have been expecting. A birthday card with five quid in it, or a love letter, or a note from Detective Sergeant Michael Paris, retired kid asking for money. What, what I did get, I laid it all out on the table. There wasn't much. Two pieces of paper, one a torn half sheet with a note. Mike, please help. Sign K, XX, don't call me. I held the paper up to the light, but there was no watermark and no indentations indicating something written on a sheet covering it. The other piece was from a notepad. The logo in the upper right corner said Four Pillars Hotels. Not a chain I'd ever heard of, but there are lots of things I've never heard of. There was an elaborate doodle in the lower left-hand corner, all abstract, but whoever had done it had genuine artistic ability. I put on my reading glasses for a closer look and discovered that it wasn't completely abstract after all. In the very densest part of all those lines and squiggles and lattices was a single word, murder. The doodler had gone over each letter several times to make it stand out. Below the doodle, like the paper had been turned sideways so the doodle was at the top, was Wednesday, 6 p.m., Stella, 47, 30756. The third item took me from puzzle to what the fuck. A plastic card, plain black, except for a circle printed on it in shimmery metallic silver. It's a circle, not a solid dot. About an inch in diameter. The other side was brick red, or maybe drying blood red, with a black magnetized strip and tiny printing setting out terms and conditions. Who's T and C's, however, had been thoroughly scratched out and blacked over. And as if that wasn't enough, someone had punched a tiny hole through the card and attached an old-fashioned property ticket with a bit of cord. On the ticket, someone had hand-printed room 47. Below that, in smaller letters, not a hotel, belongs to the Eternity Club. The Eternity Club. I'd never heard of that either, but given what, I'd had, what I had heard today, it definitely sounded like my kind of place. Now, London is lousy with private clubs, the most well-known being the Groucho Club, named for the Marx brother, who so famously proclaimed that he didn't want to join any club that would have someone like him as a member. There are lots more, and all of them charge a fortune for membership, so no one has to suffer the indignity of belonging to one that would have anyone with a bank account like mine, or yours, for a member. Most are so exclusive that civilians like me have never heard of them. That's okay. It's not like I ever think about exclusive clubs anyway. Although, a friend of mine took me to the Groucho once as a guest, and if I were ever gonna join one, where did it go? And if I were ever going to join one, I'd join that one. They're a classy bunch. But after a doctor says you might have only two years to live, a place called the Eternity Club will definitely pique your interest. Not that I had any idea what it really was. The black card reminded me of that Uber American Express card, the one that's several levels above platinum, and so exclusive it's just plain black. It's like the little black dress of credit cards. But this one wasn't blank. I looked from the note to, to Mike, to the doodle, and then to the card with the property tag. I rearranged them on the table in front of me as if that would tell me anything. And so of gun, it did. I've left the envelope on the table, placing the note from the hotel just below it showed me that no longer at this address, J.E.P., and Wednesday, 6 p.m., Stella, 473756, had been printed by the same hand. Just like the tag attached, attached to the card, except for room 47. That had been written by a different person, 
The same one who had put deceased on the front of the envelope and returned to sender on the back. This had to be some kind of joke, I told myself, a prank on, Mark, on Mike Paris retired. Maybe a bunch of his fellow detectives decided to punk him on his last day at work by putting together a bunch of fake clues to a fake case. Mike, please help. K, XX, don't call me. Only TV detectives get notes like that. Truth is duller than fiction, because fiction has to be entertaining. So do jokes. Ergo, this had to be a prank. But why include a card supposedly from this fraternity club? An in-joke? Or maybe a jab at his age? Mike's so old, the only club he qualifies for is the eternity club? No, that sounded flat even just in my head. I was about to put everything back in the envelope. Instead, I found myself picking up my cell phone and dialing information. I didn't expect to get Michael Paris's number. He could have gone anywhere after retiring, Brighton, the south of France, the north of France even, or Paris. But surprisingly, he still had a number in Bristol. I called it, and a woman answered. I'm trying to reach a Michael Paris, I said after a moment of hesitation. He was a detective? This is his daughter, the woman said with formal cordiality. Can I help you? Um, is Detective Paris available? My father passed away several weeks ago, she said in quiet. I'm tolerating you because I have manners tone. I waited for her to ask how she could help me again, but apparently she wasn't that tolerant. Not that I could blame her. I'm sorry for your loss, I said. I didn't mean to bother you at such a difficult time. Did you know my father, she asked, not quite a stiff. Oh no, I'm not a cop, a uh, detective. Are you some other kind of associate? You mean like a snitch? I wanted to bite my tongue off as soon as I said it. No, it's nothing like that. I'm the, uh, this is gonna sound kind of, this is gonna sound kind of strange. Please bear with me. I have a piece of mail that was meant for your father. I said, holding the envelope in my other hand. Someone tried to send it to him and it was returned, only it went to the wrong address. I see. Did you want me to come get it? Oh, no, you can't, I said. Well, technically you can, but you could, but it's not possible. But I'm calling from London. Suddenly, that changed everything. Is this you, Karen, she snapped. Don't you know when to give up? I don't know any Karen, I said. My name is... Then you're stooging for Karen. I don't really care. It's over. My father's dead. Find some other mark. Please, Miss Paris, I'm not Karen. I don't know what you're talking about, honest. I just got this piece of mail. Looks like it might be important. There's this little black card. Yeah, sure, send it to the Avon and Somerset cop shop, she said. Or if you're really in London, you can take it to Scotland Yard for all I care. Now fuck off and don't call here again. There was a click that she hung up, which seemed anticlimactic. There's a whole generation who will never know the pleasure of slamming a phone down. <laughs> <clears throat> I picked up the note to Mike. So Kay probably stood for Karen. Big deal, as facts went, it was pretty anemic. Even knowing that she was someone who made Michael Paris's daughter very angry didn't tell me much. Hell, I didn't even know Michael Paris's daughter's name. I'd have, I'd have made a lousy detective, I thought. And then again, maybe I can improve. I fetched my laptop from the other room. Googling Michael Paris Bristol, sans quotes, got me a seemingly endless list of links to stories that, include, that included the words Michael Paris and Bristol, all listed under the question, did you mean Paris, P-A-R-I-S? Then I tried Bristol Police and discovered that you, that you can't just get a list of law enforcement officers on request, unless they're on Twitter. Then you can even see thumbnail photos, but there were no detectives among them. I followed a few, thinking I could ask them about Michael Paris in a direct message, only to find that you can't direct message anyone who isn't following you back. I kept searching, and eventually I found Michael Paris's obit. It was a frustratingly short. It was frustratingly short. He died two months ago, aged 56, and would be missed by his husband, Mark Ramirez, and his brother, Arthur Paris, and that was all. No children. Cremation had been at the South Bristol Crematorium, in lieu of flowers, people could make a donation to Macmillan Cancer or to Ball Boys, a testicular chance, cancer charity. Ball Boys for testicular cancer, save the tatas for breast cancer. Uterine cancer didn't lend itself to that kind of whimsy, but then neither did rectal cancer, although it could have. They were missing an opportunity to give out ribbons saying, assholes need love too. <laughs> you think a lot of crazy shit when you get cancer. 
I was still thinking when the phone rang, startling me so I nearly jumped out of my skin. I looked at the screen. It was the number I'd called an hour ago. Didn't see that coming, I thought, pressing the answer button. Hello, I said. This is Michael Paris's daughter. Is this the person who called me earlier? Not a bit angry now. In fact, she was practically oozing concern. Why, I asked. I just wanted to apologize for how I spoke to you. I'm still grieving for my father. I still can't believe he's gone. We were very close. Yeah, I said, so close you're not even mentioned in the obituary. Long moment of silence. I could practically hear the wheels turning as she tried to think of an answer for that. My father was a complicated man. It wasn't always very easy to be his daughter. We were estranged for a long time, and then at the end of last year, we finally reconnected. Uh-huh, I said, another briefer silence. When you called, I was going through some of our family things, and I was feeling very emotional. I'm afraid I took it out on you. Apology accepted, I said. Anything else? You said you had some mail that looked important, including a black card. You say that card should have been in with my father's papers, but after you called, I checked, and it's missing. You seem to have found it. Yeah, I took your advice. Pardon? I emailed it to the Bristol Police Department. You'll have to talk to them. Liar. Just like that. The growl was back in her voice. Sounds like you're getting emotional again, I said breezily. We all handle grief in our own way. Don't bother calling back to apologize. I'll just forgive you now. I know you've still got it. I chuckled. I don't know what your deal is, but it's not my circus and not my monkeys. Oh, it most certainly is your circus. Keep screwing around with me and I'll make a monkey out of you. Save yourself a hell of a lot of time and trouble and send me Mike's mail. I'll give you an address. Okay, I said. Let me get a pencil and something to write on. I put the phone down, counted to five, and picked it up again. Go ahead. M. Paris, 89 6th Avenue. As she spoke, I checked the address into Google Maps, enlarged it, and then pressed for Street View. Could you repeat that back to me so we can be sure you have it right? She was trying not to be impatient now. No, I said. Street View shows nothing on 6th Avenue except warehouses and garages. You think you're funny, she barked. We can use Google, too. We've got your phone number, and we know you're in London. You want the circus? Well, the circus is coming to town, and when you're, we're through with you... I hung up and shut my phone off. Then I sat staring at the blank screen, wondering if I should take out the battery and break the SIM card, like in the movies. <laughs> no, I should turn my phone back on and call the police. Better yet, take this misdirected piece of mail to the nearest police station and make a report. <laughs> I reached the envelope and then stopped. Officer, I want to report that a woman called me on the phone, threatened to take me to the circus. <laughs> <laughs> I burst out laughing. Talk about cra thinking crazy shit when you get cancer. <laughs> Speaking of which, yes, officer, I was diagnosed today. Two years, they said. Yes, I'll be having chemo, but it hasn't started yet. Scared? Well, to be honest, I don't think it's really sunk in yet. What? Would I say I'm in shock? No, not exactly. Drugs? Oh, ibuprofen and antacids. Oh, you mean drug drugs. That was assuming they didn't take that much time with me. I picked up the card again. The Eternity Club, room 47. My gaze fell on the sheet from the hotel notepad. Stella, 47, Wednesday, 6 p.m. I looked at my laptop screen just to make sure. Yeah, it was almost 2 p.m. on a Wednesday. Maybe this was the craziest shit I'd ever thought in my life, but I couldn't believe it was just a coincidence. Like anyone else, I can overthink things. I spent most of my adult life analyzing data for insurance companies until I took early retirement. My first brush with cancer felt like a wake... Sorry. I always do that. Felt like a wake-up call. You know, time to smell the roses. I don't think I overthought that. All told, I'd say I'm thorough, but not obsessive, usually. But today wasn't exactly usual. In my whole life, I've never had anyone threaten me. On the phone, in person, whatever. Even when my son's father and I got divorced, there wasn't a whole lot of drama. Things got heated sometimes, but not to the point of circus metaphors. That thought didn't make me laugh. I grabbed the magnifying glass from the silverware drawer. Okay, where do you keep yours? <laughs> and studied the black card, which was apparently at the center of the issue. The front really was featureless, except for a few scratches. Fingerprints finally occurred to me. 
far too late to be useful, of course. I'd handled the thing too much. I really was a crap detective. Even I was thinking that, however, something else occurred to me. I've been living in the UK for 20 years, long enough that I have to stop and think as to whether someone has a British or North American accent. Things have become so familiar that they're completely transparent, which was why I hadn't registered, it hadn't registered on me right away that Michael Paris's so-called daughter was from Massachusetts. I hadn't noticed right away because I've grown up in Massachusetts myself. One more for the not a coincidence file. The question of what to do, or if I should do anything at all, remained. Then my gaze fell on the hotel note paper again and I realized I had decided what to do. Google, don't fail me now, I muttered, turning to the laptop. A minute later, I was fuming as I scrolled through a multitude of links to church groups and fellowships. When you're not religious yourself, it doesn't occur to you that words like eternal make some people want to pray. So should I take it back as a hint, since we were filing things under not a coincidence and I'd just been told what I'd been told? I took time to consider it and decided that there was nothing even remotely liturgical about this card or the, or the tag attached to it, or the two pieces of paper that had come with it. All the eternity clubs on my laptop screen were groups of people. This eternity club had rooms, at least 47, maybe even more. Yahoo gave me the same results and so did all the other search engines. Disappointed, I went to my, to my home page just to have something other than a list of prayer groups in front of me. I smiled at the cute animal of the day, but I didn't feel it. Maybe if I changed the background to a lighter color, I thought, it might lift my spirits. But as I was about to move the cursor, I saw something I'd used more times than I could count. I clicked on the box under search for things to do in London today, tonight, and typed the Eternity Club. <coughs> The image that appeared on my screen didn't last even five seconds before it flipped to 404, page not found. But that was okay. It had lasted long enough for me to see the address was in Soho. Not surprising, most, most private clubs were. I slipped my laptop and after a moment's thought, the power lead into a shoulder bag made sure all the windows were locked before I left the house. Tim was still puttering around in the front yard. I considered asking him to let me know if any angry strangers came around asking for me, and then decided against it. I'd have to come up with a reason, and I don't like telling stupid lies. Worse, the truth sounded like a stupid lie. So I just tried to look busy again as I hurried off to the bus stop. But since there wasn't really any hurry, I took the number 29 bus southbound towards central London. Depending on the time of day, it could take anywhere between 40 minutes to something over an hour to get from my neighborhood to the edge of Soho. I sat on the upper level and stared out the window at nothing in particular. And then for no reason at all, I remembered I hadn't called my Macmillan nurse back. I fished out my phone and turned it back on. As soon as I did, it rang. It was that number. She, uh, Michael Paris's da fake daughter had already, had probably already left a dozen messages on my voicemail. Maybe I could get rid of her now once and for all. What, I said, trying to sound both bored and badass. Look, you're only property that doesn't belong to you, she said, doing her best impression of a reasonable person. Suppose I had something that belonged to you. Wouldn't you want to get it back? I don't know that I've got anything that belongs to you, I said. I don't even know your name, your real name, I added, as she starts to say something. It's Michaela. My friends call me Mike. I got a very slight hesitation between the first two words. Maybe that means nothing, or maybe she had to stop and think of something that would go with the nickname Mike. Nice try, I told her, and hung up. Immediately, I dialed my Macmillan nurse. Naturally, I got her voicemail. I left a message. The moment I hung up, the phone rang again. What's the matter with you, she demanded before I could even say hello. That card means nothing to you. You can't use it for anything. But you can? She stumbled and stuttered. Tell me what it's for, and I'll consider mailing it to you, I said. It's... It's private, she said. I can't divulge that information. You're not, it's not. Okay, let's try something easier, I said. Who's Karen? Why are you being such an asshole, she demanded. I hung up again, not because I was offended, but because it was a good question, and I didn't have an answer. I turned my phone off so I could think undisturbed. Why was I being such an asshole? It didn't take very long for the answer to come to me. Cancer, of course. This was a weird little episode in which I had randomly acquired some measure of control and it was completely unrelated to cancer in my sudden foreshortened lifespan. 
Okay, I was taking my problems out on someone else, but it served her right. She was lying about where she, where she was to get her hands on the late Michael Paris's mail. She was lying about who she was to get her hands on the late Michael Paris's mail. And let's not forget that she threatened me with a circus, but still, <laughs> she could have offered me a reward instead, a hundred pounds, even just 50. And I'd have sent the goddamn envelope to her by overnight mail. Well, after I found out what the Eternity Club was, 